Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Shall we pr- pray before we come round God's words? And so, Heavenly Father, in this, in this time, in this moment, God, we just want to, first and foremost, continue to put you at the forefront, to have you as our focus. You are worthy of it all. You deserve all the praise. You deserve all the glory. And Lord, we pray, Lord, in this time, would your kingdom continue to, to come, Lord? Would your Holy Spirit continue to speak to all of us, down to our innermost being? Lord, I pray, Lord, may we, all of us receive what you want to impart to us this morning. And Lord, we pray, and I pray, Lord, anything that's of me may be blown away and forgotten, but Lord, anything that's of you, Lord, may it just resound in our hearts. We bring transforming, transform, transformation to us, Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray, would your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you want to open up your Bibles or turn them on, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4 from verse 1. And we're going to be uh, talking on the subject of your nothing is something. Your nothing is something. And we are coming into this part, this passage where we have a woman and she's in desperate need and beyond, I think it's beyond desperate, you could possibly describe it. And we're going to, the words are up on screen and it says this. 2 Kings chapter 4 from verse 1 says, Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? She said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all the neighbours, empty vessels, and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another. Then all the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. We we have this woman, and it's amazing, isn't it, when all of us know that when the tough times come, life doesn't perhaps work around our crisis. No, time and time again, it seems like when one thing happens, the next thing happens, and it's just like a bombardment, isn't it? Sometimes we think, oh, is there, just, is there any just peace? Is there, can it just stop? We just need a moment's rest. I just need to, I just need to breathe. Can I just have a, a week? Can I have a day where there just isn't any problems to think about and to worry about? And I wonder if we put ourselves in this woman's situation, it's through no fault of her of own that her husband has passed away. He's one of Elisha's uh, disciples, fellow pro, uh, tra- trainees, l- l- learning, for, l- l- learning, learning from him. And he's the breadwinner of the, of the family. He would provide protection. He'll be looking after, and I can imagine after a little bit of time how perhaps the money was going down, the food was going bare in the house, and perhaps she had to buy, she had to sell things, and it got to the point where she buys so much, there's nothing in the house left to sell apart, and it's there, and she's at her wit's end. I wonder, for her, how many sleepless nights did she have? I mean, I, sometimes we can have sleepless nights over our bills, over different things, over things in, in jobs. But can you, can you imagine being told, oh, by the, way, by the way, you've got your debts and because you can't pay, we're coming for your children. I, I would be worried. I wouldn't be sleeping. I'd be thinking, okay, where can I run to? Where, 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 can, I, where, where, can, I, where can I go? And she's beyond desperate. She's, she has only one hope and she goes to... 
Elisha, and she asks, bear in mind, she, she doesn't really, we don't know, but she, probably not, she doesn't really have a relationship with Elisha. She just knows that her husband was a trainee, and so she doesn't even go in her own name. She goes in her husband's name. She doesn't even recognize who she is. She doesn't, the value of herself has got to a point where even her value to this person, I can't go in my own value because I'm not, I'm not good enough. If I just go by myself, they'll just turn, turn me away. I wonder, do we ever get to that point where we feel like we, we're not um, worthy enough? We lost who we are. There's so much discouragement. There's so much crisis that has come our way that it feels like we're just in a constant, constant battle. I know, from, I know from myself, discouragement has come. And I know growing up in school with bullying, I used to have to fight my way into, into school sometimes. I used to have to fight my way out of school just because I haven't really grown. I'm the same size. I've probably always been, just been the short, just been the short one, so easy, easy target. And sometimes, um, and with my dyslexia, this is a constant, constant battle of not understanding, trying to grasp and, and you just feel and feel like, am I, you know, I'm trying a hundred times hard, harder than anyone else, but yet I'm not even reaching their standard, and they're not even trying. And everyone's looking down and saying, James, you can't really do that. James, you can't read really that. And soon after, well, if you believe what the world is speaking into, if you believe what the enemy is speaking into, you begin to lose value in yourself. You begin to not value yourself. You begin to say, okay, I'm not actually worth that. And actually, your, your valuation of yourself, and you devalue yourself. And so, although you can be the richest person in the world, you can still have a, de- a deficit of not knowing of who you are. Being lonely. You can be a fantastic business. You can be a, uh, even someone who hasn't a lot of, a lot of, a lot of money, but be, be poor. Be poor sales. Everyone in every single circumstances can have a deficit or something. And we can all live in that deficit. We can all live in, you know, in one areas of our lives are going really well, but other areas I just feel like, do you know what? Discouragement has just, it's just calm and it's just hit there, it's just rested. I don't know about you, but discouragement, uh, especially for myself, when discouragement has flown me around, discouragement is a bold thing. When you wake up, it's right there next to you. When you're going down for your breakfast and you're eating your toast or your cereal or your porridge or whatever you do, discouragement sits right next to you. Even though you're trying to battle, you're driving on the way to work, it's there. When you're trying to meet your friends and family and you're trying to have a good time, it's right next to you. Because sometimes we don't, we don't check it. We just think, okay, I'm just going to, some, some, someone said something, life has happened, I've gone through this tough situation, and here I am, this must be my lot. And so we take on board perhaps what the world says, or what the enemy says, and perhaps we take on board what we say about ourselves. I always muck up. I'm always a letdown. I'm a waste of space. It would just be easier if I was to, you know, just roll over, move away, leave. Everyone would be so much more happier. Have you ever felt those thoughts? Battled those thoughts? We get to a place where we come to people and even sometimes we come to God and we see it we see ourselves as a deficit. We, sometimes we don't even... We just like hold back because it's like, are we really worthy? Can we really come into that presence? And she's trying to stri- strike up a relationship with, with Elijah just so she can get a little bit of help. Not much, just a little bit. And I wonder if, in talking to her, and we, and we, and we read it, and, and, she's, and she's saying, look, I've got, this pro- I've got this problem. And although it doesn't say, the Bible just can't read, it doesn't give for any pauses, it doesn't give any, any looks that they might have, it might not have given any, it just, it almost, sometimes it just states the facts. And I wonder if, when Elijah is, Elijah is, is uh, talking to this woman, whether, when he says, Do you know what, what have you got in your house? She's looking at him going, Really? Are you listening? I don't think I explained it. I have nothing. 
Have you ever had, you ever got those people, you ever got those friends who they don't know the personal space? And when you're talking to them, they're just like, they're eyeballing you for a little bit too longer than you'd like. And they come up, they come up, and although you try and step back, they take a step forward. It's like an invitation. And so you end up doing a little dance, because although you're trying to get away, because you're like, I just want a personal space. They're like, oh, let's, go. yep. And it's just like, I wonder how much of a, Elijah, he was just looking at her, it's dead in the eye, and she's like, I haven't got anything. I haven't got anything. And he's just going, really? And he's just eyeballing her for that little bit longer than possibly that everyone's comfortable for. Getting a little bit unconscious, he goes, well, I've got an oil jar. <laughs> and sometimes what we have and what God has given us, sometimes we don't give credit. And, we, and, we dis, and because of discouragement, because of what people said in our lives, whether it's the gifts, whether it's the abilities, what God's called you for, because discouragement, because frustration, business anger has come our way, the opportunities were given to someone else and not, and not to you, we devalue what God has placed in your life. Not for your glory, but for his. Because we, we have to remember that all the glory and honor goes back to God. And God doesn't make a mistake. So the strengths that each and every single one of you have, although be it different, which is good, that's how he created you, or the gifts that he has given you are not a mistake. You sitting here this morning, no matter what people have perhaps said over you, you are not a mistake. The giftings that you have got are not a mistake. God didn't run, run, rummage around in a bag and say, oh, okay, you can have that one. He knew who you're going to meet. He knew the people who you're going to be around. He knew what you're going to do. And he's given you the gifts and abilities to equip yourself in order, because you are made in the image of God, you reflect his character. So when you show mercy and kindness and so on, you reflect and you signpost them to him. That he flows through you. He works through you. The gifts that he's given you, why? In order, not so you find fulfillment in doing that and saying, God, you're amazing because I know for myself and I, I know standing here, I know my ins and outs, I know my flaws, I know my weaknesses, I know my strengths, and I know standing here is not me. I don't know how I got here. God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> but in recognizing, God, it is not me, it is all you, our worship increases. But also in that moment where we realize when we're giving, perhaps giving the words of encouragement to someone, because in this day, how much, we all need encouragement in this season, don't we? In this time where the world is constantly dragging people down, don't talk about social media, that's a pitfall in its own. That's a toxic pitfall of everyone trying to bring everyone down, everyone has to be right. When everyone's saying, do you know what, I'm not going to do, I'm not even going to say something to anyone, I'm not going to bring encouragement because I need encouragement. And in doing so, it's just a vicious, vicious echo chamber that everyone's trying to fight to be right. Everyone knows I, I'm right and everyone's got an opinion and there's no grace and there's no mercy and there's no kindness. But yet amongst that, God has created us to work in partner with him in order that his kingdom come and his will be done and he flows through us. Oil, we know in the, in the Bible, is representative of many things. It can, it, it can be a, a commodity that's used for trading, for cooking. We know it's oil was used in, in, in the sacrifices given to God. We know that oil is used for the anointing of kings. We know it's a representation when they talk about the oil. The oil it's the representation of the, the Holy Spirit, the power, the, pa the power of God flowing, flowing, flowing through. And we know that God, when you're, if you're a Christian, Christian, you believe, you know that the Holy Spirit comes and he's there and he lives inside of all of us. And he's cheering all of us on and he's cheering all of you on. And I wonder, what is he cheering you on? What is he inside you? What is, what is he trying to do? But we're just devaluing because we just can't do that. Just can't do that. I haven't, I, I haven't got anything. I haven't got anything. And we all know that's a lie. Because God doesn't lie. He speaks truth. 
He speaks truth. So when we read the Bible and he says, you are a chosen one, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are my heir, you are royal priesthood, you are my beloved. And we read through all of those things that he calls us. He is not lying because he loves you. He's proud of you. He's made you for who you are, quirks and all. And we all have a bit of quirks sometimes. You who you are right now are who God made you to be. But we have, as we've been talking, we have three enemies. We have Satan and some of the films out there are trying to dumb down how, you know, how nice Satan can be. But actually, Satan hates you. He despises you. He despises me. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. Why? Because we're created. God created us. He breathed into us. God loves us. He absolutely hates that. And so the Satan has come to, to seek, to kill, and to destroy everything that you have. There's no nicey-nicey about the Satan. He's got one agenda and one, one agenda only, to see you fail. And when you fail, he's laughing his head off to the bank. And how many times do we fall into that snare? Not only that, we have to sometimes face, face and fight the world. The discouragement and the, the situation and circumstances that comes from the world around us. And as we say, sometimes we have to fight even our thoughts, even our selfish desires. We have to fight and come our way. But that comes our way. But let me tell you, a robber doesn't rob an empty house. You don't see a car thief going up into the middle of the field and say, I thought there was cars going to be here. It goes to somewhere where there's going to be value. It goes to somewhere where there's significant worth that's worth, that's worth stealing. Romans eleven twenty nine says, the gifts and the calling of God upon your life are irrevocable. What God has placed inside of you, he's not going to say, do you know what, you being a bad person, I'm taking that back. He has placed those gifts, he's placed those callings, he's placing those values inside of you. Why? Because it's for his kingdom, it's for his glory, because he wants you to exceed, he wants you to excel. Because when you exceed, when he excels, when he flows through you, when you give worship to God, when you trust in him, that when you're using your gifts, I'm going to trust God when I'm using my gifts and abilities, and I'm going to give him all the glory. I'm not going to get a big head, I'm going to check my character. When you do that, the kingdom comes, people are encouraged around us, and we show and reflect the kingdom of God, and we act and become like him. But we have a choice whether we use our, we have a choice where we, what we use our gifts and abilities for. And that's the question for all of us. How are we using our gifts and abilities? Are they to encourage or, to say, or, they, or are they to discourage? I know personally over these last two or three, two or few, two or three years, I've had, I see myself as, I try to be as encouraging as, as possible. But sometimes, and you can ask my wife, I've had to fight the discouragement. And sometimes I've perhaps said something to someone else, like, actually, I've, and I've had to kind of apologize, say, look, that has come out of frustration, that has come out, I've not mean that, it's just worn me down, I've lowered my guard, instead of being encouraging, I said that. And I've had to go and apologize to a few people. I wonder as part of the first step of recognizing our gifts and abilities is to recognize, okay, God, I haven't perhaps used these gifts and abilities in an instructive way, a constructive way. Perhaps sometimes we might need to, in this journey, in the start, just go up to someone and say, do you know what? I'm really sorry. Would you forgive me? It's just a thought. Because as we lower ourselves... That's right, Poppy. That's my daughter at the back. (laughs) Preach it. As much as we lower ourselves, as John the Baptist says, when I lower myself and give God all the glory and the praise, he'll work through. 
But I wonder what she, when, when Elisha's turned around to her and said, do you know what, I want you to go and, um, yeah, can you just go and just grab other vessels from and other jars and other jugs from other places and just, just, br- just, bring, just bring them. And what you have left, I just want you to just pour into them. I wonder the look on her face and she's thinking, but I'm a bad investment. No, I'm broke. I've got debts. No one's going to invest in, in me. Have you ever felt that? God, why would you want to bless me? I'm a bad investment. You wouldn't do, you wouldn't do that. But yet the Bible still makes it clear that while we were still sinners, he, he comes, he still pours. And sometimes when we live in that discouragement, when we live in that anger, when we live in that bitterness, we stop pouring what we have by because we think, do you know what, I just have to keep what I have because if I give what I have, I'll have nothing left. And I'm on empty right now. I have nothing to give. So I'm going to let the kids do what they want because I'm not even going to challenge that because I'm on empty. I'm going to let workplace do it. I'm just going to let people do what they want. I'm not going to challenge it. Why? Because I have nothing to give. I'm on empty and I've just got a small bit and I'm not going to pour that out because if I pour that out, then I'll have absolutely nothing. And you can see the mentality going, well, if I pour, I'm going to have nothing left. And sometimes I wonder, do we feel like that? If I give, I've been let down far too much. People have just used and abused and run away. I've loved that. I loved my ex-partner, but they just ran off, so I can't love again. I can't trust people because people just let us, de- let us down. They steal, they take everything. So I'm not going to trust anyone. I'm going to keep my guard up. I'm not going to let any, anyone in. I'm not going to be good to people because every time I'm good to people, they just use me for granted. And it's no point. I just get frustrated. I get hurt. And so I'm just going to be who I am. I'm going to keep what I've got. And this is mine. That's not godly principles. We reflect God. We, we show his love just as God shows his love to us. And time and time again, how often does God keep pouring and 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 keep pouring? Even when we think, God, I'm just a bad investment. But he doesn't see you like that this morning. You're not a bad investment. You are his. He died for you. He keeps pouring himself out for you, saying, no, you can do it. The enemy can't snatch what God has placed inside of you. He can, all, he can only make you think that you can't do it. He can't take the gifts that God has given you. But he'll make it as if seem like God has. has. But if we don't check what the the enemy, what the outside world, what we speak into our lives, we live in this deficit instead of realising actually, that's not true. Actually, God has given me something to do. I have got gifts. I have got abilities. I can do. I can do it. I had, a ba- I had a battle, um, mind battle the other, other day. Poppy was, cr- Poppy was crying, so I went over and I knew if I s- sang a certain song, it would stop her crying. And w- 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 turn it, so I did that, and sure enough, that stopped her crying. It's like now, now in this parenting, doing well. And so I was doing that. Go over to read a book. But the colours of the words on the book... And the, back, and the colour of the back page meant I couldn't read because the words were jumping around. I couldn't read this book. And you go from one minute, how often can we feel like, yes, we can do it, and next minute thinking, do you know what? Am I, who am I? I can't even read a children's book. And that's how I felt. Because all the words were jumping around because the colour was the wrong colour on the book. I'm thinking, how can I even do this? And I'm supposed to teach my daughter how to read? Joy, tag. And, that's the, and, see, and again, time and time again, we have those battles. It's not necessarily the big things, it's the small things. Time and time again, the enemy will just come and lay a thought. And perhaps you have been thinking a certain way for a long period of time, and that thought just comes, and we just let that thought in. And we don't fight it, we don't, t- we don't give it a check. We don't say, actually, what does the Bible teach us? Because what does Elijah say to the, say to the woman? Go in, close the door. 
Sometimes we just want to use our giftings and what God has given us when we have the limelight, when we, have, um, when we get all the praise and people just going up and say, actually, first and foremost, it's about character. It's about can you do it behind the closed doors when nobody is, watch, when nobody is watching, not wanting praise, not wanting glory? Are you willing to pour out what God has given you and trusting him? So when you're pouring, I wonder how many jugs and jars the kids bought because we know that they're, they're enthusiastic, aren't they? They don't just bring one. How many do you want? Okay, I wonder if the whole room was like filled up and just going, really? No more, no more. And they're bringing more in. And she's got this little tab. I wonder when she starts pouring and it all starts to flow and she's going, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. And one gets healed up and she's just like, really? I'm trusting you. And you know, one's a push, but I wonder when she's done all of them. I wonder, I wonder, time and time and time again, have we noticed that in all of our lives, and especially in my life, when we hold on to stuff and we say, God, we just want a, new, a fresh blessing, a fresh anointing, and God's saying, well, you don't need a fresh blessing, you don't need a fresh anointing because you didn't use the old one. You're praying for something fresh, you just need to pour out what I've given you, and in, pour, in the pouring out, he then restores, and he gives, he gives more, not just for you, but for the people, because pouring out means it's giving to others. It's not becoming, becoming a dead sea where the, the, it just flows into you and you just store everything. It's about, as he pours, you give out. And as you give out, and as you're pouring out, he pours in more. He gives you the right words to say at the right time. He puts the words in your mouth. He gives the encouragement that you need. And as the psalmist, David, David in, Psalm, in Psalm 20, I was going to say 24, 23, says, you know, when he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, it's not just a random table that he's stuck up somewhere. That word is used to, in the presence of my enemies, he's laid a king's table. A table that's, rep, that's used for, in, perhaps it's this, that word is described as a king's table. It was used in courts, in part of the, uh, the temple where the, the sacrifices and the incense and things go. It's an important table and it's a private table that not just anyone can rock up to and have a meal. It's the king's table. And he says, I lay it before, he says, he lays it for us in the presence of our enemies. So when you get discouraged, it's that I'm going to close the door, I'm going to go back into that quiet place, and I'm going to read what's on the table. And the Bible, there's, there's, they, re- they reckon there's over 5,000 promises in the Bible. That's a lot of food. Plus, on top, I don't know if you can get through that. Plus, on top of that, it's about what God imparts into your spirit, what he says in those quiet moments. Because if you don't have those quiet moments, if you don't shut the door, if you're just living out all the time in the public, in the public how are you getting fed? How do you check what the world is saying against you? How do you get encouraged? What's your defense? How do you know what's on the table? When Ephesians says, God has given you every spiritual blessing. I think all of us will still be trying to work that one out and how does that work out? But I think part of that is coming and being quiet and sitting at the table and saying, God, do you know what? I am going to shut my mouth. Because time and time again, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think, when that person's saying something, I just want to just think, do you know what? I just want to give them a good dose of it back. <laughs> Have you felt like that? I just want, you know, I can give as good as you get. And it's about time and time again, God goes, James, I'm just like, but, he's just like, shh. I was like, but, you don't understand what's happening. He's like, shh. And sometimes that's the frustration between me and God. It's like, God, just, just let me one more t- one time. Just let me. And it's like, quiet. He will vindicate you. Don't worry about what the enemy says. Don't worry about what the world says around you. Use your gifts for his glory because the audience around the people around you, the Satan, they are not your source of identity. It's God. So as you keep pouring, saying, God, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you because you you have given me this. I'm going to give you all the praise, all glory, my identity. It doesn't matter if people are ungrateful. It doesn't matter if people leave. I'm going to keep on loving. I'm going to keep on being kind. I'm going to keep on being encouraging. I'm going to keep on doing what you've called me to do because my affirmation comes from you and not anyone else. And I'm going to keep pouring. I'm going to keep pouring and it doesn't matter if I get hurt, because I will get hurt, and we all get hurt, and we all live with the battle scars. We all live with the war wounds, but his Holy Spirit 
will come and comfort and give you strength and build you up. Can we pour? Are you willing to pour? God is not limited by the size of us, of our vessels, of what we can hold. He's not limited to that. He'll keep pouring and he'll keep giving. He'll keep using you for as long as you keep pouring. Even when it's on your deathbed, those last few words you say, he'll pour and use those words, whether it's to a doctor, whether it's to a nurse, whether it's to the family that are around you, whatever it may be. Anytime you start to pour, he'll work through. And sometimes when we look at the world around us and think, but we just want to be, we just want to be recognized. Sometimes our goal should just simply be standing before Jesus in heaven and just simply have him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And realizing what that is, and out of that, everything flows. Everything flows. He will provide everything you need. He didn't leave this woman with just deficit. Not only did he meet the need, but he said to the woman, live on the rest. I'm not going down the word of faith, spend money, do this, but I I just wonder, what does that look like? Trusting that when we pour out, God will meet that need, but he'll also input into us, he'll also provide the rest. Saying, God, I'm going to put my faith, I'm going to put my trust, I don't know what this looks like, I don't know where I'm going, but I need you to lead us, I need you to guide us, I need you... I'm going to put everything I have because I do not see the way. I just have to trust you and know that God is faithful. And if you're faithful, you're not going to leave us. You're not going to forsake us. I'm going to hold on to that knowing that when I pour out, you're going to be there. And now come what may, whether it's good times or bad times, I know that you're going to be with me through thick and thin. Because even through the darkest valley, I shall fear no evil because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you'll give me strength that I can face whatever comes my way. Why? Because you are with me in the good times and in the bad times. You are never alone. You can do it. You can do it.